Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel and thanks to everyone who has already signed up or shared, uh, commented, really appreciate it. Today I'm going to be talking a little bit about well-being overload and I think that this is very timely in terms of the new year and just everyone trying to be a better person or be a better version of themselves. And that can feel very overwhelming. There's a lot of emotional well-being advice for the veterinary profession out there right now. I know because I've shared some of it. And don't let it become overwhelming. If you're struggling with the stress of being in veterinary medicine today, just try and take one step at a time. And I'll just be giving a little tips or pointers on how you can not get overwhelmed, or at least if you do get overwhelmed, what you can do to try and become less overwhelmed. <laughs> because moving on in, again, with my memes, I just think that yeah, it's a very stressful profession. And, you know, sometimes people can tell when we're stressed and it's really hard, you know, even the most mean, well-meaning people can be like, are you okay? Like, what's wrong with you? Or are you stressed? And those kind of questions are just not helpful. So if you're the type of person who kind of tends to be like, well, I'm trying to ask to be helpful, I mean, some other helpful things might be like, oh, can I get you a snack or can I get you a coffee or, hey, do you want to chat sometime about how things are going instead of these like accusatory type questions of being like, are you stressed? What's wrong with you? Like, you don't seem okay. You seem burnt out. Like, that's just not helpful in my opinion. And, you know, it's like, yeah, I'm clearly stressed. So you asking me more about how stressed I am is not helpful. Um, and, you know, everyone's trying on their own level to mitigate the effects of how stressful it can be to be in bed mad at times. And we have all this pressure to eat healthier. And, you know, like this, ham I don't know why we're going with the hamster theme. <laughs> today. So this happens to me all the time at work where I'm just like, I have to start eating healthier. And then I'm at work and even the slightest amount of stressful uh, exam or like situation, especially if you work emergency, like I do a lot of emergency work or urgent care type work. Um, then you're just like immediately stuffing your face with the cookies or the donuts and Oh, the crumble cookies. I just found out they're a thousand calories each. So didn't realize that thought. This is why false advertising is a thing because they advertise their cookies as like 250 or 300 calories, but apparently um, that's per serving. So yeah, we order a lot of crumble at the clinics that I work at and it's just really hard not to stuff your face with cookies or pizza when you're stressed. And it doesn't help in terms of your well-being as much as I love sweets, just like the next person. So there are some healing modalities that I want to talk about. And I think these are important because there's been a boom in well-being advocates in the veterinary industry in the past few years. And You've probably seen on social media or at VAC conferences or association websites, wherever, Facebook groups, um, lots of people out there giving advice. And I think that's great that we're finally talking more about compassion fatigue, about burnout, about well-being, uh, work-life balance. I even read an article the other day that I wanted to actually film a video response for, but we'll see. That says like work-life balance is a myth. And that really upset me because it's not a myth. Like work-life balance is very possible and real. 
It's just that you need to figure out how that works for you. And there is no like cookie cutter method to follow because everyone is different and everyone's lifestyle is different. And even working emergency versus general practice has different struggles and hurdles. So um, if you see uh, anyone saying that balance is not possible or real, don't believe them. It is. Uh, but I'll have to do that another day. So I do think it's good though that, you know, people are talking about it more, but I was at a conference and someone was like at one of my lectures, they were like, this just sounds like more work. I'm not keeping up with even thinking about it is overwhelming. And I was like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Like, when you just have millions of things you need to worry about and do adding, like taking care of yourself on top of it, if you already don't have like a pretty strong system or structure for it can feel even more overwhelming. And I don't know if you guys are like me, but often when I'm overwhelmed, I will kind of just shut down and not do anything. And they actually say like procrastination or like not doing the things that actually give you joy can be a trauma response, um, a stress response. So it's kind of, it goes along with the freeze response, essentially. If you've watched any of my previous videos on trauma where I dive real deep into stress responses and trauma responses, um, you'll know what I'm talking about. So I do think that like people out there are trying, don't get me wrong. And while like doing lectures of being like, just eat more nutritious food or sleep more, or, um, do meditation and do yoga. And those are what you need to do, like drink more water. Um, yeah, I think those are helpful and they are, like Andrew Huberman says, kind of like the basics, the basics of well-being, like get exercise, drink more water, eat more nutritious whole foods, you know, all those, I'm not saying they're not valid, but there comes a point where you also have to take into account the effects of traumatic stress and our profession, as long as you continue to work in our profession, we do have a significant amount of just like traumatic stress that comes with the territory. So Peter Levine, he's one of the like PhDs of traumatology and he has a book called Waking the Tiger and an important takeaway from his book that I want to acknowledge is the importance of the mind-body connection in healing from trauma. And it's not just about relaxing or having a glass of wine or a spa day or talking it out with friends or loved ones when you have a bad day. He says, and I quote, psychology traditionally approaches trauma through its effects on the mind, end quote. This is what he writes in his book. And then open the quote again. This is at best only half the story and a wholly inadequate one. Without the body and the mind accessed together as a unit, we will not be able to deeply understand or heal trauma, end quote. So this is why these healing method slide is really important. And the question is, how do you start the journey? Well, the process of healing begins from within. And the first step is to acknowledge that you might have had traumatic experiences. You, you guys, seriously, when I go into clinics and I'm hanging out with people who know me or like know the Vet Confessionals Project, we always are talking about trauma. Like it always comes up. The other day I was at work and one of the girls, she was so funny. She was like, oh my God, I think I had some micro trauma happen. She's like, I stabbed myself in the hand with this needle by mistake. And I was like, that is kind of a micro trauma. I mean, stabbing yourself, it's painful. And yeah, we're not trying to make a mountain out of a molehill here, you know, but we were just kind of joking around and kidding, but it's true. 
it's just something in our profession that I really think it's so important we need to be aware of. So um, this healing methods actually um, are from the Body Keeps the Score book, which I talk about a lot in my trauma lectures that I do deep dives into. And that book is written by Bessel van der Kolk. And he also says that um, that in healing of trauma, at the core of recovery is self-awareness. This is why I'm saying there's no real cookie cutter way, way to do this thing of healing. And there's no cookie cutter way of figuring out what your work-life balance looks like. It's sure there are guidelines and there are different people's plans and methods you can try but just don't be discouraged if you try something that someone says absolutely is the one way that works or is the way and it doesn't work for you it just means you have to go back to the drawing board which i know is not fun but trust me it's worth it and he said, Bessel van der Kolk, and I quote, says, the most important phrases in therapy are notice that and what happens next, end quote. No, you don't need to remember exactly what it was that traumatized you because memory can be faulty. Numerous veterinary professionals have expressed to me their thoughts and difficulties in getting therapy for their compassion fatigue, actually. There are a lot of challenges, like challenges include finding the right therapist and their insurance network or making time to even go to therapy. That's another overwhelming thing, I think, sometimes, um, is the time commitment. And then believing therapy will help is also really important. There's a negative stigma around seeking therapy even, although I feel like that's actually getting less and less negative. Now more people are all about my therapist this, my therapist that, which I think is great. Um, and then there's also finding the money to pay for a therapist. You know, it's not cheap. So I'm not anti-therapy. I definitely have benefited from therapy numerous times for numerous different situations and occasions, but you know, it can feel overwhelming is all I'm saying. And I do strongly advocate for seeking professional help, but you must also be your own advocate. No lecture, no YouTube video, no therapist, I mean, including this one that I'm doing right now is a substitute for professional therapy. Like, and when I say therapist, I mean like armchair therapists on YouTube, you know, who aren't actually talking directly to you. So I do really, really believe professional, well-trained therapists can be incredible gems and supplement to your healing journey. Um, but... These, you know, it's not the end all be all. And at least these thoughts may get you moving in the right direction. You might start to be like, okay, what are these methods that I need to be looking at? And it's more specific than just drink more water, get more rest and try and relax. So going back to self-leadership and what that means is working in veterinary practice it's important to maintain mastery over ourselves at all times and that's why i love i'm gonna go over to the slide where i love schitt's creek and this is how I used to feel before working in veterinary medicine, like that I used to be a regular person. Now I have really changed. And me now, I am on day two of a panic attack. Again, Schitt's Creek is just like the best show ever. It honestly was the show that got me through the pandemic, I think. But, you know, it's this is not like how we want to stay and as funny as things can be sometimes you know ideally 
I would like to be a regular person for the most part <laughs> and not extremely unhinged because of my poor well-being. So the other thing is working as advocates for people's pets and well-being, we need to manage intense emotions as they surface. Otherwise, we risk losing opportunities to help, to connect, and to truly make a difference. This isn't the same as suppressing our emotions or numbing ourselves. This means processing emotions as they arise and working through them moment by moment in a calm way. Does it always happen that way? No, but that's the goal. We've all had at least one veterinary client who's been kicked out of our clinic or fired, as we call it, for their abusive or unruly behavior, leaving the pet possibly unable to get help and possibly just making the client some other veterinary clinic's problem. Each of us may at least once have exploded in anger at a colleague because they didn't do something the way we wanted them to, or we were just being reactive. These types of reactions often come from an inability to maintain self-leadership. You can feel like you become a victim to the circumstance, and while these reactions may seem like viable solutions at the time, they only cause more damage in the long run. This isn't to say that you should never fire a client or um, that you should never have an outburst or not feel anger or disappointment or any of those things. In the end, we're all human and we need to do what we need to do to protect ourselves in the moment. And they are often protection mechanisms when we react this way. But that need to safeguard yourself when it comes from a reactive place can be related to traumatic stress. And that's like the important thing to realize is like the individual across from you takes on the role of a perpetrator, meaning someone that wants to harm you, even if that's not their intention. Finding ways to cope with feeling overwhelmed by sensations and emotions that are associated with traumatic stress and its effects is key to self-healing and self-mastery. According to Dr. Van der Kolk, like I said, there are three approaches to regaining self-mastery, as outlined in his book, The Body Keeps the Score. The first one is top-down by talking, reconnecting with others, and allowing ourselves to understand what is going on with us while processing the memories of trauma. That's, for instance, with a professional therapist or, you know, getting into groups and talking. There's lots of different ways, but top down means from your brain, from your head, from mind, from your mind, thinking. Then there's the middle way, which is taking medications or using technologies that shut down inappropriate alarm reactions or through other technologies that change the way that brain organizes information. Uh, some examples for that is obviously like antidepressants or other types of medications that help calm down anxiety. Then there's also technologies like there's neuro-linguistic programming, for instance, and there's certain therapists out there that are using NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, to um, have like video games or have like feedback that like you respond to something and through a computer or a technology, it gives immediate feedback to a system that can help you reorganize your brain, um, restructure the dysregulation that can occur through trauma. And then lastly, the bottom up is by allowing the body to have experiences that deeply and viscerally contradict the helplessness, rage, or collapse that result from trauma. So that can be, in this case, like breath work or yoga or massage or martial arts or dance, like other physical attack or acts. So that's why... 
it doesn't necessarily have to be something you talk about with the therapist is the point that I was trying to make. By committing yourself to the process of healing, you'll come to learn more about the truth behind your reactions. And in some situations, your reactions are totally warranted. Like that person is actually trying to harm you. Where it becomes not great and not useful is when there someone is not trying to harm you. Even like what I was referring to before about the person being like, are you okay? Can come across like an attack because it's like, what are you trying to say? Like there's something wrong with me or, you know, it, and that can stem from trauma as well. So yes, I am saying like, try and be more considerate or like thoughtful in the way you phrase things, but then also understand your own like the person across from you is going to have their own perspective and their own traumas and stuff that's going to make them perceive even the most seemingly harmless thing as a potential threat. So you can regain control and be in charge of how you respond to traumatic stress. This doesn't happen overnight and neuroscientists today are aware that the brain can change and reconfigure itself back to a healthy state of functioning. The term neuroplasticity refers to the ability of the brain to rewire neuronal pathways and continue to change. This does take time and we don't really know how long it takes and there's no magic cure-all pill as much as we would like to believe there is, or magic cure-all approach, as I was saying. And our healing is often most successful when a multimodal approach is used. That's what I really want to emphasize with this healing methods chart. So becoming trauma-informed can really help our profession is truly what I believe. And having people in the veterinary profession and in your community who have studied and understand trauma and its effects is important to healing and preventing further trauma as well. Over the past decade or so, the behavioral health communities have advocated for trauma-informed care in their field for clients. This concept is being extended into the educational communities, childcare communities, and beyond. The other day, one of my friends from veterinary school messaged me and needed to talk because she felt like she was actually reliving a traumatic episode. All she needed to say to me in that moment were two words, trauma and triggered. (laughs) In that moment, I knew exactly why she'd flown into a rage accompanied by tunnel vision and hypervigilance. The people around her didn't understand what was going on and instead felt offended or upset by her actions. When she tried to explain and apologize and take responsibility for her actions, she just ended up feeling exhausted defeated, and misunderstood. It would basically, if we all made the effort to become more trauma-informed, it would help us to not only deal with each other in these situations, but also clients who are likely undergoing traumatic stress events themselves that may cause them to lash out when we're trying to help them with their pets. I really think that we need to have more trauma-informed experts in the veterinary field, and I really hope that it's not too far in the future, and this is the whole purpose of me making these videos as well, is just to really get the word out there and start the process, even though I thought I already started the process, I realize I need to try harder to get this information to people. So going on now to (laughs) passing the memes again. Um, It is true, though, you can become your own worst enemy. 
And it is important that we let go of the victim and savior mentalities. Traumatized individuals can have an investment also in being ill and may form a kind of attachment to their symptoms, like staying in bed all day. I mean, it's true. You could be on day two of a panic attack, but (laughs) you also have to realize that it can also become your worst enemy if you constantly give in to And I don't want to say like give in to because it is out of your control when you are, for instance, going into an anxiety attack or a panic attack or dealing with depression or whatever the effects of stress can cause. But what is in your control is taking care of your well-being and taking the steps to try and mitigate the things that are unfortunately out of our control at times. So Dr. Levine from his book in Waking the Tiger also says that he says basically that people may say they're proud to be survivors and their identity can become wrapped up in the fact that they made it through traumatic situations, which isn't to say that you shouldn't be proud to be a survivor. It's just that don't make it your whole personality. And the reason for this is because you can get trapped in that identity and then become stuck there. And that's not conducive to healing. Additionally, illnesses that may arise from repetitive activation of traumatic stress may become a part of your identity. So the more you kind of stay in this loop it can have effects of reliving the trauma and reactivating your nervous system as if it's happening all over again. This may also be apparent in the sort of dysfunctional ways we learn to deal with traumatic stress in veterinary medicine. For instance, if we view clients as perpetrators and pets as victims, we can become attached to the idea of victimhood or martyr type personas and force ourselves into a role of savior savior or survivor of the terrible things inflicted on us or on animals. We may then become attached to this high that we feel when we hate on or fight a client or a coworker. It kind of gives you like this jolt of dopamine or like this feeling of being alive and because you're playing this role. And I'm not saying that situations of animal abuse or neglect don't happen in our field and that you don't have the right to be angry or to try and save that animal or anything like that. I'm just asking for you to discern at what point is this truly what's going on here? Because I'm not advocating that veterinary professionals should also either stay in potentially toxic or abusive relationships or workplaces. Because part of the problem is the stories they tell about themselves in those traumatic encounters. My goal is for all of us to start learning to exercise caution when judging, to question whether our perspective is in fact what's truly happening, or if we're seeing others through only the lens of our trauma. And this is where it can get a little difficult too, because when you are on this journey of questioning and self-discovery, there are also people out there who are manipulative, who try and tell you that you are interpreting a situation incorrectly. And that's where things can be a little bit dangerous as well. But the more you practice it with trusted professionals and trusted individuals who can give you outside opinions who don't have a stake in manipulating you, and this again is why a professional therapist is so valuable or professionals that are trained in dealing with traumatic situations can be so valuable as opposed to just some random person that you're asking the opinion of or someone who has a stake in 
convincing you of a certain thing, um, that's where you kind of just have to be careful. I know this might add more to the overwhelm, but trust me, it's worth it putting in this work and doing the baby steps to heal. One thing that I really found useful was actually uh, looking at this mental health continuum model. And this can help you decide kind of where you're at in terms of like the actions you need to take. And I really like this continuum because it's true. Like you can be anywhere on the continuum on any given day in any given moment. And it really does depend where you're at, depending on how much work you should probably be putting into your well-being. So if you're feeling pretty good, you're in the green, that's the healthy marker. Um, you have normal fluctuations in mood. You have normal sleep patterns. Physically, you feel well and you feel full of energy. You have consistent performance. You're socially active. And then below, it has the actions to take at each phase. So in your healthy phase, you just focus on the task at hand. Um, you can break problems into manageable chunks. You can identify and nurture support systems. Like for me, it's like going to my yoga and like going to my yoga community and maintaining a healthy lifestyle. So not leaning so much on substances, for instance, to cope. And then we have reacting in the yellow. We have injured in orange. And then we have ill in red. And reacting, you might become more when you're in the yellow zone, more nervous, more irritable, maybe more sad. You might have more trouble sleeping. You might feel a little bit more tired or low energy. You might have more muscle tensions or headaches or procrastination like we talked about. That can be a stress reaction when you're stuck in kind of like a freeze. Um, you can have decreased social activity. And some actions you can take during that time is to recognize your limits, like maybe don't take on something new and scary if you're in this time, like at work, don't take on additional responsibilities, maybe say no more often, set better boundaries, get more rest, food and exercise again, going back to like drink more water, eat more nutritious food, sleep better, um, exercise. Yes, those things are important. But I just really want to emphasize how important trauma is as well. And then try and engage in healthy coping strategies, like maybe call your friend and go to that yoga class or start doing the meditation on Insight Timer or something like that and identify and minimize your stressors. Maybe reflect on like, okay, what's going on? Like, why am I feeling this way right now? And what can I do about it? It really helps you feel more empowered. And then if you're in orange, then you're maybe a little bit more injured. You might have more anxiety, anger, a more pervasive sadness, like a sadness that you just can't shake or a hopelessness type feeling. Um, you might be more restless or you might have disturbed sleep. You might have more fatigue and aches and pains you just might be less present and have decreased performance and overall maybe more social avoidance or complete withdrawal from society. And I'm not saying on certain times, like especially as an introvert at times, I mean, technically I'm an ambivert, so I'm both introvert and extrovert, but I know that like as introverts, sometimes people really need social withdrawal to regain their energy. But this is more like a you're really withdrawn. Okay. This isn't just like, oh, I'm enjoying my time alone. This is beyond that. Like, oh, I need time alone to just recharge. That's not what this is talking about. So again, actions you can take at this phase of the continuum would be to identify and understand your own signs of distress. So what are the things that like technically when you're injured mentally, mental health wise, what are your own signs of distress? 
Like, what do you notice that you tend to do more? Like, do you go and get more crumble cookies more often, for instance? <laughs> I'm not trying to pick on crumble, but I'm just really disappointed that their cookies are a thousand calories each. Anyway, um, or do you maybe tend to binge watch Netflix more or something like, and not to say like any of these coping mechanisms are necessarily bad. It's just like, how much is a, of it? Are you leaning on it? And, or do you not brush your teeth as often? Do you not brush your hair? Does your personal hygiene kind of go out the window? Like those are things you need to figure out what your own signs of distress are. And then talk with someone, seek help, professional help and seek social support instead of withdrawing. I know it may seem like that's the last thing you want to do, but trust me, you will start to realize the benefit of seeking social support with a trusted group. Okay. That's the other important thing is like, you can't just go to anyone and be like, I need support. Cause that person may not know how to help you or may not be like the person to help you, but just try and find the groups that are out there that are generally trying to help and they are out there and you can seek support through them and it's not weak. And it, even if you're like, this is so dumb, I don't want to do this. Just do it. I mean, I just listened to one of Andrew Huberman's podcasts or YouTube videos that um, talks about, oh, it's the, it's the David Goggins one. And David Goggins <laughs> is a very interesting character. And I love listening to it. Honestly, I was kind of shocked by that episode. But one of the things they bring up is how um, your medial prefrontal cortex, I think, or anyway, it's not important what part of the brain it is. There is a part for the purpose of this conversation. There is a part in your brain that like grows and does more amazing things. I'm like totally butchering it, but by forcing yourself to do the thing that you don't want to do. So once something becomes a habit and I guess like you get used to doing it, then that part of your brain kind of just becomes like in maintenance mode. Like it's not really growing or evolving or strengthening, but the more you do the things that are difficult. So like, that's why it kind of reminded me of the yoga pose or not the yoga pose, but the school of Iyengar yoga. If you know who Iyengar, BKS Iyengar is, he would always say he teaches a style of Hatha yoga. And he would always say that the pose begins when you want to come out of it. And I just love that saying because it's so true. Because once you're in a pose and you're like, okay, this is great. I'm in warrior two or down dog or whatever it is. And then you're like, oh, I'm used to doing this pose. I love this pose. But there comes a point where it's going to feel uncomfortable and you're going to want to come out of it. But try and stay just a few extra breaths. Like that's how when I teach, I try and people always get annoyed and you get the death stares for sure, where you're just like, why, why are they making it so hard? But really, like, if you can do the thing that is hard or that you want to come out of, or as soon as it gets hard, if you're just like, ah, oh, okay, I'm done. I did the pose. No, stay in it just a little bit longer. See if you can push yourself to stay that extra five minutes. The same comes with like doing things like seeking social support. In the end, it's good for your brain. So do it, even if it's difficult. And then lastly, we're at the ill section where you're in the red, you have excessive anxiety, you're easily enraged, you're depressed mood overall, unable to fall asleep or stay asleep, just pure exhaustion, physical illness, unable to perform duties, absent, like you're calling out sick, you just can't even show up, you're just avoiding everything in general. And this is where it's very important to seek consultation with either your doctor or your therapist or any of the hotlines that are available. 
or text lines for mental health crises because trust me, you're just in the red and you need to figure out a way to at least get back to orange. And like I said, baby steps because it's a continuum. You're always going to be fluctuating from one place to the next. And depending on what we deal with in our professions can really like we can be in green and all of a sudden end up in red. And that could just be a very traumatic case that happens, something that like totally wipes you out. And these things can happen. And I think it's just really important to realize like it's normal. It's just like any other illness, like having a, like burning your hand or being in a house fire. It's, you know, take the steps necessary to heal and healing is possible even though it may be difficult to see from where you're at. Like, I don't know, just remember that it's baby steps that take time, okay? Because when I first applied to veterinary school, I used to think I was never, and I mean never, ever, ever going to be able to perform surgery. I was convinced that I was going to fail veterinary school because of it. Um, But it didn't deter me from applying. I just figured I'd cross that bridge when I came to it. Or maybe I could just call out sick from every surgery rotation and hope no one noticed. Yeah, right. Part of that fear was related to my hands being shaky and part of it was because I couldn't even fathom doing surgery because I literally knew nothing about anatomy or physiology like when you're thinking about surgeons and now I don't think that way at all I'm just like wow anatomy is so easy or like surgery makes sense now but before you understand so much it just seems like whoa like so crazy, all these things. And you can't even fathom doing surgery because you literally think it's like magic. (laughs) At least that's what I thought. And as you may have figured out, of course, I passed veterinary school and yes, I performed surgeries. But how did I do this? And I know it seems cliche, but it's because I took one thing's one step at a time, one breath at a time. And I got made fun of for having shaky hands. Okay. I have a whole article I wrote about having shaky hands and I have had people reach out to me being like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad you wrote this article. Like I had a very similar thing. And like, I like this gave me so much hope. And even one of the doctors I worked with, who was an amazing surgeon told me she was like that too, when she first started out. So Just know that like things get better and you can get better. And I don't think throwing someone into the deep end and hoping they can swim or at least not drown is an intelligent approach to teaching someone how to swim. Like, of course, if it came to that, sure. But this is why I think baby steps are really important and celebrating the small wins because I needed to learn anatomy first. Then I needed to try cutting the dead things, like doing the cadaver anatomy. Then on live things and so on. And I bet almost all of you can tell me a similar story about something you never thought you were going to be able to do. And then somehow you have accomplished it and it happened one step at a time. So if you do have a story like that and you'd like to share with me, please do so because I love those stories and I just think they're so inspiring. So you can either share through the Veterinary Confessionals Project website anonymously and I'll link that down below or just comment below in the video, however you feel like it. Because the reason I'm talking about this is that healing from traumatic stress and taking care of your mental health is no different. It may seem like a lot of work at first and that you'll never get there. But all you do is take one step at a time, keep chipping away, forgive yourself when you fall off the bandwagon, 
and congratulate yourself when you take one more small step in that direction. You know, sometimes it's two steps forward, five steps back, like walking up a gravel volcano, you know, the scree that when you're for New Zealanders, I know they know this because we've all walked up those mountains and those volcanoes, but you eventually get to the top like you do, even though it seems like you're not going to. So I just want to end with one other little story and this meme that I think is hilarious also because I love lemurs and this for some reason reminds me of Madagascar, the king lemur guy. I can't remember his name. Um, But anyway, it may seem like you don't have all day for inner peace, but it's okay. You know, just keep working at it, keep chipping away. And I want to end with the story of another conference attendee who when I was in Kansas City one year, I was doing a lecture on well-being and then I was in Kansas City again and leading like yoga and meditation classes between giving my lectures. And a woman came up to me in Kansas City and she said she'd been to another lecture of mine the year before. In that lecture, she perked up when she heard me say, If all you take away from this class is an attempt to try meditation, then do that one thing. And then we ran into each other again serendipitously the following year. And she was so excited (laughs) because I was leading the meditation class and she remembered me. And she told me that after she left my lecture last year, she downloaded a meditation app and had been doing one meditation a day for 365 days. It changed her life for the better. And she acknowledged that while she knows she still has a lot of work to do, she could look back on the year and recognize how far she'd come. And that was just like such an inspiring story that made my heart so happy. And I was like, see, this is why this is so important to keep spreading these kind of messages and letting people know that if someone promises you overnight success on your well-being, like they're either delusional or unrealistic or just trying to sell you something, honestly. So don't give up. Even if you get overwhelmed with all the advice out there, just take one baby step, one book, one app, one new habit, and sometimes fall on your butt, look around, feel sorry for yourself maybe for a second or two and get up and try again. So on that note, thanks for listening and I'll see you next time. Bye.